Ciao. A question, Angus, of a theological nature. I'll see what I can do. Did Jesus have a cat? I wouldn't have thought. I imagined you in China, by the way. You said, imagine me in China. I'm like, well, I've never been to Ireland, so... <laughs> You're already in an imaginary place as far as I'm concerned. Imagine you in China, why not? Now imagine me in space, you might say, and then, uh, you know, all kinds of other places. Imagine me a thousand years ago. Well, that I can't do. I, I know. I, here with us, everybody. What? I know, I'd be dead without modern medicine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have lived past that viral pneumonia that nearly knocked me out a couple of years ago. Is that true? It, uh, genuinely true. I am here because of modern medicine. So anytime someone says to me, when would you like to live in the past? My answer is, after antibiotics. Yeah, like five minutes ago might be good. Otherwise, I really don't want to think about it too much. Boy, are you saying that you believe in the power of medicine? Why, <laughs> yes, I am, Ken. That's, that's just that's crazy science. talk. That is just crazy talk around some parts. We're not going to talk about that, though. Well, I don't know what we're going to talk about, actually, because this is another one of those days, because uh, it's Friday, as people hear this. Uh, this is another one of those days that I mostly turn over to the guest. Uh, Monday, of course, it was news to Bart. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Funny enough, uh, Bart actually sort of drove the bus this whole week. And then uh, Friday, he said, I'm really looking forward to playing Wheel of Stuff. And I said, well, sucks to be you, because we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, I was too busy moving house when you were spinning wheels of stuff. I know, stuff, so I, I know. My turn. It's, it's fine, because that will come back at some point, because unlike Wheel of Stuff, which you can play over and over again with people, uh, Dinner Party, not unlike the album side, you can't you can't say, well, no, now, now pick three other people. So this won't live as long as the Wheel of Stuff, but it will burn at least as bright. Who knows? Maybe twice. Uh, I think with Allison's contribution a few weeks ago, I, I'm like, everyone else is, all of us after that are in real trouble, because we yeah. can't possibly. Pete. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I've had to go. It's not well. I mean, it's not a competition. I, I mean, she did set the <laughs> bar really high, but it's fine. It's not a competition. I think what I said uh, on the following dinner party was, let's just assume that Allison's great great granddaughter is there. Uh, so, so don't worry about it. Yeah, you've got that part. You're at least as good now as Allison Sheridan because Yay. you know her great-great-granddaughter will also tell her about the dinner that with you. So it, it's going to be fine. Ah, the, the thing so, is, so you're saying I've made Allison's dinner better by being there to talk to... Uh, assuming she's any good at communication. I mean, she may be staring at what passes for a phone in the 80 years the whole time, going, yeah, great-grandma, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. You know, Why am I here? Can I go outside <laughs> now? My date is waiting. Uh, right, so what we're doing now is dinner party. And it's basically you get two and a half to three hours to hang out with three people that you want to talk to. Uh, time period does not matter. Whether you share the same language does not matter. The only thing I ask is they be actual people, real people, or acknowledged as real people. I mean, do we really know if there was an actual Moses? I don't know if we know there was an actual Moses. It was like several thousand years ago. But historically yeah. accepted, so why not? Uh, uh, just you know, rules, I can't talk to the most famous other Belgian, which is Hercule Poirot. It's terrible that the most famous Belgian is a fictitious character written by an English woman. But yeah, that's kind of that's kind of odd. Although uh, you, you've educated me today, I thought I thought uh, Poirot was uh, French. I, ironically, if you've ever read the books, that would make him so angry. It's just yeah. not funny. Anyway. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's a plot point. Anyway. So so now is the time where we, you know, uh, get you in the dining room there. You, your three guests are showing up. They have been sent invitations. I'm curious uh, who it was the first invitation went to. So I've decided to do my invitations based on the things I like. So okay. the first thing I adore is photography. Mm -hmm. So my first invitation I wanted to give to a photographer who... I thought was like something special, but probably not that well known. So I have picked one of the earliest female British photographers who should get far more credit than she does. She's a woman called Julia Margaret Cameron. She's a Victorian lady, very much British Empire, born in India, spent some time in South Africa before ending up on the Isle of Wight, just outside England. Mm -hmm. Um she was an aristocrat and was given a camera by her kids when she turned 48, hmm. basically because they thought she'd get bored having raised all 11 of them. Okay. <laughs> it all finally fled the coop. 
So she got into photography at age 48 in the middle of Victorian England, where everyone thought that photography was for men because it had stinky chemicals and it wasn't a woman's thing. And how dare she? Mm -hmm. She didn't care. Um, everyone else was fixated and fascinated with being technically perfect. They were all pixel peepers and chimpers. And she was interested in taking artistic portraits that actually capture the feel of a person. So she used soft focus. She used very dramatic lighting. She used, she was one of the first people to do real close-ups. So she took the most amazing portraits. And because she was in high British society, she took the most amazing portraits of the most amazing people, including Charles Darwin hmm. and the astronomer Royal, who was one of her friends. Um, and so like, she just, she made these amazing pho photographs. She was absolutely scoffed at and ridiculed by the hoi polloi of the day, basically all the men in the boys club. Mm -hmm. And her, photogra her photographs stand up today as amazing portraits because they are timeless, because they actually capture the humanity of people instead of being fixated and being tech sharp. So let me ask a question. What do you want to talk to her about? How, how do you how how do you go about getting these people to sit in front of your camera? How do you, how do you think about taking a portrait of someone? What like what goes through your mind to to how do you capture the essence of a person in a single snap? Hmm. Fascinating. Because I'm terrible at portraits. <laughs> like I I do a lot of photography. You will notice there are extremely few people in my photographs. I'm terrible at people pictures. <laughs> okay. I'm curious, are you, are you, uh, yeah, I'm not going to insult you by asking if you're familiar with Mike Disfarmer. Are you a fan of Mike Disfarmer? Um, I don't, ha I am v not strongly enough familiar with to have an informed opinion. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, I know of, but don't really know well enough. Okay. All right. Yeah. He's somebody that I feel like I should study a bit more. I more know stuff around him. Like there was a fantastic documentary about a puppeteer who guy, well, not a puppeteer. He does, he does puppet shows, but like as theater and he actually did a play or a puppet presentation about Mike Disfarmer. And so most of what I know about Disfarmer actually comes from, from that documentary. Although I watched another documentary about Disfarmer as well. Hmm. Weird, weird portraiture, not weird. Uh, anyway, people can look him up if they want to. They don't have to if they don't. I was just curious what... Well, I think I'm going to. Well, okay. Have fun and tell me how it goes. Uh, who's the uh, who's the second guest at dinner, sir? So, A, I'm going to cheat a little bit, but you did tell me to give it only 50% effort, so I decided I to did. give it 100% effort and cheat slightly. Okay. <laughs> In fairness, I told him to give it 50% because he was really upset about Wheel of Stuff. I, I, I definitely <laughs> want to play the Wheel of Stuff someday, Ken. <laughs> You'll get um, to. I promise. You'll get to. Good. Good. So the other thing that's big in my life is computers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to invite someone to represent that. And as an LGBT person in computers, the obvious choice would have been um, the Turing. But mm -hmm. I decided no, because there's a game I love to play when sometimes when I'm, I go to, I cycle for two hours every day. And sometimes the headphones die and I can't listen to podcasts and I have to entertain myself. No, and boo, I like to do, boo, I I'm so against that. <laughs> I like to imagine myself explaining modern technology to the person who invented it. So explaining a modern airplane to the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. So I, part of me was actually tempted to pick the Wright brothers, but it turns out a modern airplane is really very similar to the Wright flyer. So then I imagined explaining an iPhone to Charles Babbage, who invented a mechanical computer with a crank that you turned mm -hmm. and it went clunk, 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 clunk and did the maths. Actually, they have one in the Science Museum in London. I turned the handle. It is this amazing brass. It's amazing, a mechanical computer. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so Charles Babbage would definitely be a cool guest. But actually, he had a really close associate. Like, he worked with someone who would also be a cool guest. One of, She is sometimes referred to as the world's earliest computer programmer, Ada Lovelace, who was the daughter of Lord Byron, just to add a bit more interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decided that uh, I'd bring along Babbage and a plus one. So I will have Babbage and Ada Lovelace as my second guest. I remember explain to both of them what an iPhone is. If I didn't like you so much, I, I, would, I would say you're disqualified. I would say you now have to <laughs> leave the table and they're going to have a good conversation because there are only four seats. But you really did want to play Wheel of Stuff. So, OK, although anybody listening who gets to play this in the future, it's really not OK. 
<laughs> Who's your fourth guest? Or third, well, fourth guest. I was going to say fourth guest. Like, no, no, it's only the third, but it is actually fourth for you. Guest. It's the fourth. Well, yeah, okay. Who is, who is your who is your last uh, who is your last guest, sir? So the last thing I am was a complete civics dork. So I wanted to invite along some a fellow civics dork who would be a fantastic conversationalist. So I have decided to go with Malcolm Gladwell, the um, New Yorker writer, podcaster, and all round very intelligent and very entertaining person. Hmm. Interesting. That's see, I don't know. He might intimidate me in conversation. I'm curious. What would is there anything in particular that you'd want to talk to him about, or do you just know that like? If the conversation faltered, Malcolm Gladwell would be there. Well, a yes, he would definitely be. The, if, if everything else goes, you know, goes south, I'm pretty sure he'll pick up the conversation. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure he'll have an opinion that's well informed on anything that comes up. So whatever the heck is on the news on the day that we have this wonderful dinner party, mm-hmm. or whatever it is that Charles Babbage says that's very controversial. Mm-hmm. I am pretty darn sure Malcolm Gladwell will have an opinion on the matter and be able to chime in and go, well, actually, I think you'll find that the right thing to do is to treat the poor with respect, you silly Victorian you. Uh, <laughs> right. Is there anything in particular, though, that you would want to talk to him about? I, it would have to be whatever was going on at the time. At the moment, he actually has a new book out about um, the the bomber mafia, basically the fairly difficult moral choices that the Allies made during the Second World War, where they basically bombed civilians. Mm -hmm. And you could argue it's a war crime, or you could argue it's saving civilization. I'd really quite like to talk to him about that, because I don't know what my opinion is on that. Talk to me today, and I'll say that I think Bomber Harris is terrible, he's a war criminal, and talk to me the next day, and it's like, yeah, but it was Hitler. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it is an interesting group that you have put together, and I, I, I don't want to keep you all from, uh, from your lovely meal, so uh, your waiter will be by in a moment. Let me just thank you, Barbara Shots, for being here this week, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll play Wheel of Stuff soon. Yay! Yay!